Hello and welcome to another edition of Theology Prepper where we're learning more and more how to be prepared for dealing with the world, the flesh, and the devil in this life. Uh, we're using Thomas Brooks' book, uh, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. Because uh, again, as I've said through all these little lessons, that as we know how the enemy is going to attack us, then we can create a sure defense to stop it or to even circumvent around it to come out ahead. Um, so we need to know the tactics of our enemy from time to time to know how to stand up against them, to, to have a ready and sure defense, uh, to be wise in this world about what's going on and how to stand firm uh, until the end. We're entering a new section of the book uh, where he discusses Satan's devices to keep saints in a sad, doubting, questioning, and uncomfortable condition. So you see a sad Christian, you know, well, why is that? What's got them down? You know, well, that's what Thomas Brooks is going to look at with us, or what we're going to look at from him, rather. Uh, he has eight devices and their remedies. The first one we're looking at today. He says, what does Satan do? He says, by causing saints to remember their sins more than their Savior. Yes, even to forget and neglect their Savior. You ever done a little self-introspection sometimes? You get something of a thought in your head of something maybe you did who knows how long ago. And it rings so true today that you get some type of panic by it. You can't believe you did it. The, the horrendousness of whatever that sin is comes rushing back. And you almost, either it makes you sad, maybe it makes you doubt, maybe it makes you question. Or it takes you, at least temporarily, hopefully, only temporarily, takes your eyes off of Christ. So when that happens, Thomas Brooks says, well, let me give you six remedies for when that happens. So as you get those flashbacks about sin, maybe it's even current sin that you're in. He says, remember these six things. Okay, one, though Jesus Christ has not freed believers from sin's presence, he has freed them from its damnatory power. So first, as you think about sin, Christian, it cannot condemn you. It cannot send you to hell. If you stand in Christ, then you stand in Christ. If he's answered for your sins, he's answered for all your sins. And we may still sin. We may live in a world where sin is present. And we may reflect back on some very horrendous sins. But we trust Christ to be greater than all our sins. So then two. Though Jesus Christ has not freed believers from the vexing and molesting power of sin, he has freed them from the reign and dominion of sin. So it can't convict us. It can't send us to hell anymore. But also, we have to realize as Christians, we are not under sin's dominion. Yes, it still exists. Yes, it's still a force in our lives, a very tempting force at times. But it does not have the power to make us sin. If we sin, we gave into it. But Thomas Brooks is saying, cast your eyes on Jesus, who is greater than all our sins. He was tempted just as we are, but he overcome our sin. He overcame all of any type of temptation he had faced and followed through in all things well into the cross. A new life, resurrection, ascended to his Father. That we need to have him in focus. Sin is not the reigning principle in our lives. We have to look to Christ in his word. His law is our counselors. His love is our motivation. Uh, so those the first two things. Third thing, it is needful to keep one eye on the promise of remission of sin and the other eye on the inward operations of sin. 
So he's, he's saying, hey, have these two things in mind when you start wondering about how deep your sin is or something you just did or something maybe you used to do. And it's got you down. You know, you're sad about it. You're starting to question your salvation because of whatever it was you did. Well, consider keeping an eye on, hey, my sins are in a sense in remission. I'm sinning less. I'm more for God than I used to be but yet also have a, an eye on those sins. How are my sins operating? You know, what are they taking advantage of in me? What tactic are they using against me? What temptations keep cycling themselves over and over in my, my head or in my environment that I should probably work on getting rid of those, seeing how they operate against me, twisting me away from Christ instead of me bending myself back to Christ. So, and why? Well, in four, because believers' sins have been charged to the account of Christ as debts, which he has fully satisfied. So this kind of goes back to the first one a bit. Um, so not only are we free from sin, it can't send us to hell, but we need to realize that's because all of them have been charged already to Christ. All of our sins have been nailed to the cross. You know, even ones we haven't done yet that we're going to greatly despise. Hopefully they're not as great as things in the past, but whatever they may be, they're nailed to the cross. I stand in Christ because I have faith in what he did. I'm still striving to follow and conform myself to his image. I'm not going to do that perfectly in this life, but I'm not the focus. My focus as a believer is Christ. My righteousness is because, like it said here in number four, it's what my sins were charged to his account. His righteousness has been credited to my account. And that's justification. Okay, so five then. The Lord has good reasons for allowing his people to be troubled with sinful corruption. You know, well, if we were made perfect, holy, and righteous in this life, uh, right upon regeneration, uh, we probably wouldn't be any good in this world. You know, we'd all be running around, you know, thus saith the Lord. You know, I don't know what we would be doing. But, but there's a learning that goes on in our sanctification that it's not pop, it's all done for you. Yay. It's pop, you're saved. But now work out your salvation with this type of fear, reverence, uh, respect for God and what he's given you. So we're given the opportunity to toil through this life. And yeah, that's not a great thing. Um, but with any th great thing, uh, think of uh, if you were a millionaire. And, and or, I don't know, the million goes that far these days. Okay, so you're a billionaire, trillionaire, whatever. You have kids. Are you going to give them all of their inheritance all at once and say, well, just here you go. Well, you know, A prudent parent would say, no, of course not. They're going to blow it on, on toys and junk, and they're just going to become depraved and all the stuff that they want, and nothing's ever going to be enough. And all that I built up to give them, they're going to abuse and misuse and make a, a mockery of it. So you let them toil. You let them go to school. You make them get a job. You make them learn certain life lessons. Although they're hard, you know, they're, they're not going to be easy, but you let them learn those things so that they can become responsible with the blessing that's about to be given them. So they understand and will appreciate what they're being given all the more. Now, I can't obviously answer for God of what his full motivations for us are. I'm only using that parental type of uh, illustration there as as God is said to be our father I can only imagine that something of the gist of how he's looking at how he uses our condition in this life to not only follow him in faith but yet in our experiences of sin still use those even to look to him and to trust and have faith in him who is to come again and then, so in the last one, uh, believers must repent of their being discouraged by their sins. 
So we think of praying for our sins and maybe that comes a little too remote. Uh, maybe even at church you have part of the service where you have a remission of sins where you, you pray uh, at home or there in church, like I said, uh, of, of confessing your sins to God. Um, uh, but along the lines of just confessing the sins, confess how you've handled those sins. Did you let sins cloud your vision of Christ? Did you let sin bring you down? You know, here you are before the face of think think of your best day where God and you feel so close in your walk with God. What happened that brought you down? You know, were, did it something happen and you just kick it to the side and say, nope, I'm not gonna go down, I'm not gonna get sad, I'm not gonna get troubled. I'm gonna stay in my focus, stay in my walk with Christ. That's what I'm gonna stay with. It's like, no, sometimes we have our sin, but then we let the consequence of the sin even bring us farther down. So he's saying, hey, be mindful of repenting of your sin, but also couching that sin and almost coddling that sin to say, well, oh my gosh, I'm having such a bad day now. Uh, I did X, Y, and Z, and X, Y, and Z sin has now brought me to this low. Oh, woe is me. Ooh why you have the means and wherewithal to just go back to the father father i sin christ here i am laid before you you know forgive me of this whatever it is i've done you let that not hinder my relationship with you where was i i don't know what i was thinking that i deviated let's get back on track uh let's go read your word maybe i need to pray a little bit more but but we have the means to I don't want to say restore ourselves, but but in a way it's like that. We, we don't have to wallow in the shame and sorrow and sadness of our sins. We should be able to say, yeah, okay, I sinned, I, I get that, and I am sorrowful about the sins I commit, but I'm not going to wallow in it like it's totally now ruined my day or my relationship with Christ, because at the end of the day, Christ holds on to me, and at the end of the day, I need to get back going again um, I've used uh, before as like a farming illustration uh, we're saved out of this world and into the family of Christ it's like getting saved or brought into a farming family you may not know a thing about farming um, so you get up in the morning you get early you try to learn what some of the chores are and you do some of the things and you make a mistake well because you've made a mistake and you spilled some milk. Well, you go and confess, you know, oh, you know, Father, I've spilled the milk. The, the, the day's worth of milk is now gone and ruined. You know, does that mean you give up all the rest of your day? Does that mean you're divorced from the family? Does that mean you go and hide in your room the rest of the day? You know, no, you, you bring it before the Father. The milk is spilled. Now what do I do? Do, do I go milk some more? Is there a different cow? Uh, do, do I move on to another chore? You keep about the business of farming. We're not going to do it perfectly. We're going to spill things. But we keep on striving to be more and more Christ-like day by day. We don't let it get us down. We don't let it cloud our, ju our judgments and our minds, our thinking. Uh, and, and when it does that, we have to turn ourselves back to Christ. Ask for God's help. Ask for the Holy Spirit's help. Hey, I, I don't know even what to say here today. Help me to you know, get this across to my Father. I'm in pain. I, I've suffered something. I, I need to get back on track. So, so that's the first point. Uh, one of uh, eight devices for this type of idea. Being sad, doubting. Uh, the big topic these days, people doubting their faith, doubting their, their comfort in Christ. Um, so we'll look at this more, obviously, next time. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Please, like always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And we'll keep this going and hopefully be able to do this again and again and again. Uh, uh, but God bless. Take care. Have a blessed week. Bye-bye.